I think we're streaming live, so welcome everyone to episode, we said 13, right? I think so. I think so. Yeah, we got to keep track of this. Uh, so here we are, coffee time with Julie and Nate. Very excited once again, although Nate's um, on to the 1.30 in the morning glass of wine. Um, hi, Julie. Hi. <laughs> I was just getting the whole thing set up. Yes. Um, and the other thing is, actually, right before we started, and this is, I'm not sure if we, we're going to spend too much time talking about this, but um, you said lucky number 13, and I was like, oh, actually, uh, 13 is not even a big deal over here. I live in Korea where the number four is the unlucky number. Um, I think it's because it looks like the symbol for the word death. There's a relationship between death and the number four. So in a lot of hospitals, all the hospitals and a majority of apartments, your uh, elevator buttons will say one, two, three, and then F. Um, so yeah, so but funny. I know, but the reason I, I was thinking about that just now is because um, it's been so interesting, like learning about different cultures and learning about different sort of points of view and and realizing you know i worked for a radio station for several years and at the very beginning when they were not evil and terrible um hmm. something they would mention is you know it's not wrong it's just different and and that was sort of in, supposed to be an invitation to non-koreans to have a a different perspective and take a different look at the way things operate over here versus the way you think they're supposed to operate based on where you're coming from. Um, and for me, like with the tools of access and the interesting point of view tool and all of who does this belong to and, oh, it belongs to my parents or my grandparents or my culture or my middle school teacher or whatever. Um, yeah, just the tools of access are crazy applicable when you're dealing with different cultures and societies and things like that. Um, yeah. Well, and like literally everything. It's really funny. Yeah. Because I, um, I had somebody sign up on my website for a possibility session and okay. you know, prepaid for it and was trying to find a time and and I'm like, so, you know, what would you like to work on? Cause she was like, is it in person? Is it hands-on? What's the difference? What's the symphony session? And I'm sitting there, we're going back and forth on email with all these different, like there's so much to access. There's so much we can do. Yeah. There's so much you can change. It can apply to literally anything. And yeah. I felt like I was overwhelming her. And I'm like, you know what? I know there's a lot just, tell me what you want to change and right. we'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> and the other, the other crazy thing about access tools, I was on a, a Zoom with, it was majority of Indians and it was sort of advertised for the Indians who are involved with access. And this one woman, she just kept coming back to like, I'm using the tool and it's not working for me. Why isn't it working for me? Am I doing it wrong? <laughs> and, and all I could think was like, if it's not working for you, then you're allowed to choose a different tool. Like all the tools don't work the same way for all the people all the time. So if you change your body situation using the tool of who does this belong to, it doesn't mean it's going to always work that way for everybody. You might change your body situation using a different tool of like talking to your body and like asking your body. I mean, the breadth and range of tools is insane. It's, it's crazy. And if you have an expectation of how it's going to work or what it has to look like or how it's going to show up or how long it's going to take or that it's not working you pretty much stopped it anyway. Yeah. Because <laughs> you yeah. don't have a question anymore. You're like looking for a result. 
you if you've decided how the tool is supposed to work and another tool that came up was the facelift and mm. if you if you look at the facelift as only like erasing wrinkles or causing your skin to be tighter and brighter and younger that's that's such a limited scope of what is possible to change using the facelift process like you can use it to change i mean your money situation you can use it to change anything because it's not just only limited to your your skin <laughs> like well, it's, yeah no it it more like goes to your being and invites your being to be more so that changes everything yeah it's a really yeah. cool process i love the facelift i know and the facelift um it's it was so crazy for me when i was in china for the last it was a cop with brendan mm -hmm. man the days of sitting in class ah oh, that was so I nice. know. <laughs> and then you can go up to someone and say hey can you do my bars and then they can do your bars yeah um, with different people from all over the world it's like yeah so i had made an announcement that i was doing sop sessions um and i guess i just was charging more money than people were willing to pay for it or they didn't even really know what was on offer um or so you i just was want to receive it trying to hang it out <laughs> well that's a good question but it was that wasn't if you're going to make a pie chart of what was going on there, that would have been a small slice. Okay. Um, but I had a woman come up to me and she's, she was like, Hey, can you do the facelift process? I was like, all right, sure. Uh, so she did my bars and I did the facelift process and I finished and she was just like, that was unbelievable. That was amazing. Please let me give you some money. And she just like, pulled out some money and gave it to me. And then her friend was like, oh, I have to have the same thing. I was like, well, I mean, all right. So I gave her a face of process and then she finished and she was like, oh, I got to give you some money. That was amazing. And, <laughs> and it wasn't because they looked in a mirror when they were finished. It wasn't because they thought that they looked younger and sexier and whatever. It was because of how how because of the energy and the space that i was with them and then allowed them to be during that session that's called the facelift right mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. yeah so yeah have you ever done that with bars too like i've i've done bars with people and they're like oh my god i feel like i've never actually had my bars run now that i've had them run by you it's aren't you amazing well, we like, okay, sure. I'm amazing, <laughs> but so can we all be. And I think part of, part of what it is, is um, not being in your head, not trying to get it right, but really like being present energetically and being expanded while you're doing the process, not like contracting and, you know, trying to be perfect. Yeah. I remember when I ran Dane's bars, um, it was in a class, I think it was in Houston, and he was doing sessions in the back, and he looked exhausted, and I went up, and I was like, dude, can I run your bars? And he's like, no, I have to work, and then probably a half hour later, he tapped on my shoulder. He's like, okay, <laughs> and I remember when I first started, I was like, oh my god, I'm running Dane's bars, but then I was like, you know what, fuck it. I'm gonna be here with him. He, his body needed to relax and you know and receive and i it was just all that shit goes out of your head and you just become this energy and i always ask to turn it up turn it up turn it up turn it up so that you really get a good session it's not just you know little trickle trickle of change right yeah and i mean we we also kind of talked about this before we got the camera rolling but there's another element to this which is you see someone who you think is really amazing at doing something and then you think 
that you want to emulate them or imitate them or be what they're being. And you kind of become, I mean, the example, you know, someone's like, oh, I want to be Dane Jr. And Dane's like, no, I don't want you to be Dane Jr. I want you to be you, you. Like there's no, you're going to be and you, and you do be a different energy and space and contribution to consciousness and to everyone than anyone else does. You're completely unique. And being you and being in that space of you is going to be the greatest contribution. So, I mean, even listening to us talk about these situations and someone's like, oh, I'm going to run a facelift like that or oh, I really want to do Dane's bars. It's like, well, you can be that kind of a contribution being you in any and every situation. It's about the, the space of being, right? Like, be you and change the world is such a, it's such a powerful statement. And you look at it from so many different angles and like, what does it mean to be me? And you can, you're being you in every situation. And you're not, you're not being someone else. So, you know, when you're doing Dane's bars, you're, you're being Julie and that's what is required. It's not required for you to be Gary because Gary has done Dane's bars as well, but you bring something that Gary doesn't have. Like how insane is that of a statement to, for someone to be like, wow, <laughs> I can, I can be and have something that Gary doesn't. And Gary would be like, yeah, fucking do and be that and start creating because I'm looking for, <laughs> right, like, yeah, yeah, step up and do that because fucking I'm done with being it by myself. <laughs> it's funny. Um, we weren't raised to be ourselves. And the next generation, well, you know, my kids and other kids who are raised around access and and probably more than just access nowadays are are raised to be themselves and not trying to be something different and um my daughter had this post on i saw that on facebook yeah i just it was just a little piece of it and it it's just so amazing and i wrote something to her like you know i love who you be and she said you raised an old soul and she's like you know, for me, I was raised to be me. And what a gift that is, you know? Yeah. Because all of us, <laughs> we're like, who the fuck am I? And you yeah. have to weed through all the places where you tried to perfect the image to be what other people needed and wanted and projected and expected you to be. Well, you're supposed to be. Yeah. Like. I bought a book called What Should I Be When I Grow Up? Like, and it was, I mean, it was, it was a really good book. And it was, it was just all different stories and vignettes about people who had become adults and then given up what they had been doing to do something that they really enjoyed. Like it was, there were a lot of, of great stories in there, but just the idea that you're supposed to, and you should be, and you have to do this. Yeah. You know, um, well, everything that I loved when I was younger, it was like, oh, well, you can't do that. You know, you can't be an artist. Why do you want to be right. a starving artist? You know, so it's like, oh, shit. Well, what I really love is wrong. So I'll have to force myself into something else and yeah. make it look great. <laughs> yeah. I didn't listen to that yeah. for too long. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't listen to that for too long. Yeah. I, man, my mom really wanted me to be a business major and do something practical and accounting. And like, that didn't, that didn't take. Yeah. 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 It's funny. My sister and I both say that um, my grandparents told us that we should go into banking and we should start as a teller and work our way up. I actually, <laughs> I actually did have a bank job. <laughs> and we were like, why? 
Like that is so randomly <laughs> not us. <laughs> yeah. Huh. And you know, speaking of, of being raised with access and having access tools available to you when you're a kid, um, I also just noticed that Shannon and Grace did a podcast. Like Shannon has her regular podcast, but she did one with Grace just recently about growing up with the tools of access and like mm -hmm. what I haven't listened to it yet, but I'm excited because, did. oh, did you? It was good. Yeah. Yeah. And see, that's what you're doing because you have kids and you're doing that. Yeah. And it also like it, it was interesting because I knew them when they were kids. <laughs> <laughs> And um, Grace actually babysat my kids. Okay. On one of the first um, weekend classes that we took them. And um, right. oh my God, it was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it was interesting at one point, Gary, um, well, Grace was really upset because my daughter was being mean to her little brother. And the whole the class Tyler? stopped. Me. You know, to oh, my sorry, kids. right, right, right. And they stopped the class. He walked out, and I was like, "Oh shit!" I know this has to do with my kids. <laughs> and he yelled, and like she didn't speak the rest of the weekend. <laughs> oh no! She totally <laughs> changed and actually became really sweet then. <laughs> but so it needed to happen, and I. I at break, I said, you know, I don't know what happened, but I'm really grateful. Thank you. Yeah. He's like, sometimes you need to be fucking firm. And I'm like, I don't know. I just couldn't do it. <laughs> yeah. Have you noticed that your parenting style, I guess, has changed over the years? Or, I mean, as your, as your kids have developed through their teen years, which are reputed to be the tough ones? Well, no, I think I've, I think I've still been me. The only thing that has really changed is I can't use um, specific access words because they're real buttons for them. So I have to like, uh, tippy toe around it, but I still like, I'm like, do whatever you want to do. Right. It's your life, you're choosing you know, how can I contribute? <laughs> yeah, that's and, cool. You know, so far, they've made some really cool choices. You know, they're not into drugs. They're not into partying. They're, I'm like, really? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, yeah, I had a little different for me. Actually, my grandfather gave me a like a contract to sign when I was, I don't know, like 12 years old. It was something like, I'm never going to smoke cigarettes until I'm 25 or something. I don't even remember. But um, yeah, it was like this official kind of contract something. And I was like, all right, whatever. And, uh, and then probably was it like five years ago someone like found that and like hey look at this you signed this card I was like oh that's so weird. funny I yeah. remember being in fourth grade and they showed us a section of a lung of a smoker and then somebody <laughs> didn't smoke and I was like okay I'm just never gonna smoke <laughs> oh that's what that's what it took it wasn't the like the terrible smell or the kissing someone who smoked no, I already didn't like that, but you know, fourth grade. Yeah. I had to convince my dad to quit smoking. <laughs> there you go. Huh. Um, cool. How are things going over there for you? Like, as far as getting out and about and I mean, actually, when you mentioned the session that you had the person registered and you mentioned potentially uh, body processes or bars like is it possible that you can you can get together and do that right well um i'm not sure what's exactly legal okay 
but people are getting together in people's homes. Um, you know, when you're out in public, you know, shopping or whatever, you're supposed to wear a mask. And I see a lot of people like riding their bikes wearing a mask, which I, I would not do. And I go on a hike and I don't, you know, if you're going to cross somebody's path, you know, you just, but um, I, I don't know. I'm really, I'm not so sure about <laughs> the validity of all of this stuff, but you know, you do what you have to do. Right. Um, but I don't think you can, you know, have classes and conference centers yet here at least okay would you be allowed to have well you could have someone come over and have a session right sure i mean it's up okay. to the person and they can wear a mask or not right and, yeah okay and then class wise i mean could you have like a barge class of four to six people um i i guess i mean at my house i did okay. have i had a a couple of classes, but they were like with people who knew each other and were already together right, and okay. weren't sick and had no symptoms. So I was like, all right, I guess you, you know, for me, use your awareness. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. There's some if your body, that, go ahead, sorry. That, um, there was an article that was posted in one of the WhatsApp threads that Gary had asked people to read. Did you get that? How recently? Uh, today. I did not. Talking about um, some new information that's being released from the CDC and how, you know, if you've been tested and it's been 10 days that you should be fine. Like mm. it's not gonna, be a problem. So right. I'm hoping that this kind of stuff gets out and more people read it and the fear starts to diminish and, and we can get on with our lives because yeah. at the moment it's killing my retail business <laughs> big time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, and it's become such a, I mean, from, from here, it looks like it's become it's a, just a crazy political issue. It's not, it's even be gone, gone beyond just common sense and, and sadly, I mean, ask your body because your body, any, any time your body tells you that something is going to be bad, you should probably listen to your body. <laughs> so, you know, like you said, use your awareness. Even if you're thing. having sex, like, are you, right. are you going to get pregnant if I have sex right now? Yeah. You know, I, I've always done stuff like that and listened to my body. And there was one time that, uh, that I got food poisoning and I knew it in advance. And I don't know, I was at a gem show. I was super hungry. I got something at Whole Foods in their, you know, their big, um, you know, salad bar section. And right. I looked at it, I was like, mm. I was like, yeah, it'll be okay. No, yeah. it's not. But I knew. And yeah. that's the only time in like, my entire life where I've chosen something like that and <laughs> so I think people need to really build that trust and awareness and and their communication with their bodies and yeah you know these body processes that we teach and access can change anything I remember years ago learning how to do all kinds of things like the the DMMD one to change mm -hmm water and to change all kinds of stuff and gary was saying you know one day there may be no water available that's clean to drink and you're going to need to have this ability and i freaking um <clears throat> worked that and worked that and worked that muscle so now when i get a glass of water that smells like chlorine or tastes shitty i just put my hand over it for literally a minute and it tastes delicious so for those people who aren't maybe super familiar, um, DMMD would be demolecular manifestation and molecular demanifestation. So that is um, you know, working with the energy and working with the, the elements and the molecules um, to kind of 
get rid of the stuff that you don't want to be there and to have the stuff show up that you would like to be there. So, yeah. But I mean, I do remember that being, that was a process people did a lot, especially at the Costa Rica seven day, people would sit around after class with glasses of wine and everybody would just be like hanging out with their like hands over the wine. I do um, want almost yeah. everything. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, well, again, they have this thing called, was it Ocean? Ocean's Cleanup? No, it was like Ocean 300 or something like that. Somebody set up this. Um, this was a few years ago, yeah? It was a long, t yeah, 10, okay. 12 years ago. Right. Um, and what they wanted to do was, Gary was saying to, to help change the situation with the plastic in the ocean yep. that we would need i think it was 300 300 people to be on this ship, ship and go and out yeah all gonna do dmmb and so he was like i'm gonna hand pick the people that can do this without a point of view but yep. who can run the process so i started teaching the process at all these different trade shows and i would do it like when i went on a date i would do it and, you know, somebody would drink their water and go, Ugh, and I'm like, oh, look, you can do this. <laughs> really? And they're like, wow, that's amazing. Because it changes, <laughs> like, quickly. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, pick, I, up, pick up lines with Julie. There you go. <laughs> yeah, somebody orders a house wine and they take a sip and they're like, oh, hey, I can change that. <laughs> anyway. Wow. Yeah, um, I wanted to be one of the people to go. So yeah, I of course, practice and practice and practice a lot. Yeah, I remember that, and then it didn't actually. They never got it together. No, I think I think they said that something changed. Like we changed tracks right. then too. Yeah, and something Both changed the vocabulary of that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, man, changing tracks has been something that's really fascinating to me in conversations in the last like month or so. And um, actually I, I talked to someone the other day and they said to me, <laughs> they were like, Nate, have you changed tracks in the last couple months? Like me individually, not like the planet collectively. Uh, have you changed tracks? And then the, or are you another walk-in? Cause I've walked in a couple of times and I was like, no, I, I haven't walked in. Hmm. I, I guess I've changed tracks. And the idea of track changing has just been so present in the, the conversations in classes and with people. And I also, I just saw in, I think it was one of your emails in the last week or so. And you said something oh, about yeah. changing tracks. Yeah. Um, and that's such a, it's still such a mind boggling concept to me because it, it makes me so aware of how much I base everything on the past, how all of my decisions and choices are based off of evidence gathered from past experiences and, and everything that has sort of, yeah, it's just, it's a complete, yeah. Yeah. So can't really do that anymore. <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah. And so what? What? What else? It's. What it's. Else? I think that's why. Um, you know, choosing more classes now and like really learning how to be present and how to extrapolate and how to create using the tools of access consciousness is so imperative because. Yeah. You know, you can't, you can't function the way we used to anymore. We can't lean on thinking, figuring out, yeah. triangulating and all of that. It has to be choice, question, possibility, contribution. And then whew, all kinds of things show up. It's like, wow. Yeah. yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Um, ah, it's already 10 o'clock. I know. I was going to say, it looks like you have to go to your other thing already. 
Yes. We, we start this off and then, sorry? It's time for my expand group. Yes. Um, uh -huh. Awesome. Well, um, nice to see you again. Yeah, good to see you too. And um, I hope this was interesting for people. <laughs> we're just rambling about stuff. I know, we're just talking about stuff. We but have, <laughs> If we did have some questions, we would, we would play with that. I think so. for the next week, I should more actively look for some questions. Okay. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, we'd love to do that. Because as you said, question, choice, possibility, contribution. Question, questions are huge. Yes, they are. So, all right, well, enjoy your expand thing. And um, I'll see you, well, I mean, I'll see you before next week, but. All right. Officially, I'll see you next week. All right. Take Bye. care, everybody. See you next time. Bye-bye.